see first and foremost uh, the evidence act section 135 of the evidence act deals with examination that is part 10 and it is very uh, you should if you read the provisions of the act it's very clear what are the things you should be doing and what are the things you should not be doing but this is all on paper so when you enter the or when you are doing the cross examination what are the practical or the ground realities which any advocate or any junior faces is what is going to be the subject of this uh, session and i am going to do it in two parts because the first part will be doing with the principles of or the nuances which is which i have highlighted in my I mean, it's what my senior taught me mr goin swaminathan how to do the cross examination what do you do when a witness enters the box now before going into that or uh, the nuances let me uh, uh, refresh your memory with a few provisions of the evidence act now section 137 of the evidence act deals with examination in chief then cross examination then re examination 138 deals with the order of examination 139 deals with cross examination of a person who is called to produce a document then regarding section 140 deals with witness to the character that is the character of the witness can be the subject of a cross examination then leading questions any question suggesting the answer which the person putting it wishes or expects to receive is called a leading question when they must not be asked that is 142 when leading questions cannot be asked i am just refreshing you certain basic uh, rules so that you can understand the subject very easily or uh, it will be very easy for you to follow leading questions must not if objected to by the adverse party be asked in an examination in chief or in re examination except with the permission of the court so leading questions cannot be asked in a examination in chief or re examination if it is objected to by the other party but when i am going to deal with the nuances of cross examination you will be asking only leading questions because there is no bar under the evidence act from asking leading questions in a cross examination that is one of the nuances of cross examination next 143 when they may be asked leading questions may be asked in cross examination so this is a provision in the evidence act which permits you to ask leading questions in the cross examination so these are the basic rules which i would like you to uh, understand or keep it in mind when i am doing with the topic called nuances of cross examination now coming to the topic everybody will be uh, eager to ask questions to the witness in cross examination the first rule you must always keep it in at the back of my mind or your mind when you are doing the cross examination is do not do cross examination that is why you will be surprised to uh, hear this from me because this is what my uh, the my my seniors taught me first is do not if it is possible do not do cross examination or do not entertain cross -examination. this is also supported by the provision if you are if you see the provision 138 witnesses shall be first examined in chief then now see the bracket if the adverse party so desires cross examined then if the party calling him so desires re examined so the option they have very specifically mentioned that unless it is optional for you to do the cross examination 
do not do cross examination the reason being if the facts of the case which you are appearing may be civil or may be criminal are admitted by the opposite party or if there is no denial by the opposite party it is deemed to be admitted that is a question of argument you don't have to do a cross examination for that to prove your case you, are, you I mean, all of you know that if a case has to be won it has to stand on its own legs that means your pleadings your documents and your uh, evidence whatever you are going to prove other than that will have to prove or substantiate your case you cannot find the loopholes in the opposite side to substantiate your case so that is the basic principle that is why it says under section 138 if he so desires he can be cross examined now keeping this at the back of your mind or keeping this at the back of the mind now let us see let us now see why this is an optional thing why cross examination is only optional and not mandatory the first thing is all of you when you are doing the trial work or most of you when you started doing the trial work would probably be influenced by the pictures or the tv serials you see where the witness at the end or the or the accused in a criminal case uh, unable to face the barrage of questions by the advocate accepts his guilt or becomes silent so you all feel that this is what we should be doing in a cross examination but in reality this does not happen because in a tv serial or in a movie it is scripted that is the director writes the script and it is shown to all of you but in reality does this happen no what happens in reality is the witness always tries to out with you so he will try to give an answer which is probably not relevant for the question or he will try to give an answer which will defeat the very purpose of you asking the question or he will keep quiet which means that it is neither here nor there unless you are able to give positive evidence through your pleadings or through your documents so this is what happens when you are actually dealing with the witness in the box now the first there are about 10 rules the witness under cross examination will fight tooth and nail to confound you definitely he will say you know it is his it is a matter of life and death for him when you are when he enters the box and he wants to confront you it is a matter of life and death for him because he either has to be cleverer than you or he will have to confound you so that your questions become toothless that means ineffective then he will give you evasive answers he will give you answers you know you normally what happens is when a when a person asks a question when an advocate asks a question to the witness uh the objective of the advocate is to get an answer which will probably suit the case or probably convince his client because the clients are normally there when you are doing the cross examination but does the witness follow that pattern no he will always try to give evasive answers he will try to use your questions to strengthen his testimony that is he will repeat the questions which you ask so that he will try to strengthen his testimony or try to find loopholes in your pleadings so that he fits in that gap so what he does is suppose there is a, a pleading which is vague suppose there is a vague pleading and he will try to explain that saying that this is not the way it is understood this is not the way you should uh, treat this uh, subject so these are the things which a witness will always try to uh, counter handle you when you are asking questions in the cross examination then next is he will keep repeating your questions as as if he has not understood the question 
because he will be preparing his answers in his mind so that he can give you a, an answer which totally is irrelevant or what he does is he says uh, suppose you ask a question where you there on that particular night in the party he will say no but he will start explaining why or how he was not there or he had an alibi to prove that he was not the culprit it could be one of the reasons so what what normally we should do is always ask leading questions where you there or not we don't then when he starts explaining you have to object saying that you there is no necessity for any explanation it's a straight question okay were you there or you're not there that's all but once you start allowing the witness to explain then you are diluting the answers which means that the, when you argue the case after the evidence the judge may have a doubt regarding that particular event or that particular incident or that particular portion of the pleading which probably is the highlight of your case so never ever ask questions for which he can give an explanation never allow him to give an explanation you will have to cut short that witness to a particular point the next is the next is every question which you put to the witness is an invitation to disaster that means you should be very careful in asking the questions you cannot invite disaster by putting questions in the cross examination for which you don't know the answer that's very very important so now keeping this in mind this is a brief introduction to the nuances of cross examination now keeping this in mind what is that you are going to do with the witness and what are the rules you need to follow while handling the witness let us take the witness who is very very um, who is a probably a chronic litigant or a person who has seen enough cases in the court to know the, the 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 how to handle the advocate because the witnesses are also equally clever uh, handling the advocates because if you are not very sure about your case then i think you should not be uh, entertaining the cross examination unless you are prepared or don't do cross examination that's the first rule because under section 138 it is only an option for you to cross examine let us go to the next few uh, rules the first thing you should keep in mind when you are cross examining is don't do any cross examination mechanically you uh, have to think twice before you uh, before you really uh, uh, want to cross examine a particular witness think about it put yourself in the position where you will have to ask you are the you are the opponent of advocate you will have to ask yourself what would be the repercussions of cross examining a particular witness because if your pleadings are very sure and if there is no denial on your pleadings you need not have to expose yourself examination what you have to do is just to ask a few leading questions maybe to satisfy your clients or maybe you have any doubts on your pleadings then probably to come then you probably will know whether it is necessary or not you you have to really give it a good thought don't do any cross examination mechanically now the next thing is uh always start from the point of view that if i can avoid cross examination better avoid it there is no necessity for cross examine for the sake of cross examination and dilute your case or weaken your case now if you really have to cross examine now you come to a point where you really have to you feel that you need to cross examine a witness then there are 10 rules you have to follow the 10 rules and i would strongly advise for practitioners who have put in less than 7 years of practice you will have to follow the 10 rules 
i would strongly advise that because you will never go wrong if you follow the 10 rules you will never go wrong uh, but if you really want to break those 10 rules then you have to be an expert in cross examination you should have mastered cross examination the art of cross examination as they say uh, before you break those 10 rules the 10 rules are going to be the basics for this, this topic nuances of cross examination i have made some notes which my seniors have uh, taught me uh this is this is, this is there is no textbook for this there are no textbook for this but you learn only from experience and you have to understand that these are these are the nuances which it varies from person to person but there are certain standard rules which you will have to follow it can be uh, a diverse mean that it can you can probably uh, it is a little flexible also but that depends on your uh, experience and uh, the mastery over the art of cross examination now next thing is when you are doing the cross examination ensure that you are not breaking the rules ensure that you are not breaking the rules because if you start breaking the rules you are definitely going to dilute the effectiveness of cross examination you are not only reducing the or uh, effect of cross examination you are also going to create a damage for your own clients because of your uh, exercising the wrong discretion uh, or following the uh, or breaking the rules which you should not be doing the first rule is think commando when i say think commando you are not laying a siege you really got to attack it is called think commando what does a commando do in an army he just barges in and starts firing he starts attacking so the first rule is you don't wait you are not laying a siege you have to attack it is called think commando the first rule is it means you are acting with stealth cunningness and brevity they should be your beacons when you are acting in stealth you are going to be very very clear that you are not going to expose yourself to everything and cunningly really means that you have to be really clever in understanding the psychology of the witness for example i'll give you a small example which my senior told me when we were discussing in a i think it's in a criminal case or in a civil case it's the 1950s much before i was born a witness was in the box and that particular witness was a senior citizen and he was the village headman and <coughs> sorry as you all know in those days the village headman had a lot of respect and he was supposed to be uh, a knowledgeable person as far as the village is concerned now the when he was put into the box the advocate or the person who for whom he is representing the advocate was asking him questions which are probably uncomfortable even for the other side adavadu avara patti vende oru mari rough a pesittu irundanga and the advocate was examining the headman other avarude own witness his own witness he was asking certain questions which were uh, which he, my senior thought was a little rude which he would not be asking his uh, witness so the witness was a little shaken and he stopped answering those questions that is where you know the 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 psychology of the witness has to be understood by the examining advocate so my uh, my boss was watching him and i knew that this man being a very respectable person was is not being handled or was handled in a rather shabby manner so and the headman knowing that you know he is not being treated with respect started stopped answering any questions so the purpose of the witness entering the box became futile for the prosecution the very purpose for which you are examining your witness becomes a futile exercise so when my boss got up he understood the 
psychology and addressed him in the following manner. I'm going to say that in Tamil. He said, Ayya Vanakko. He, he addressed him like this. Ayya Vanakko. Ayya Vapatti Yengilik Ellarakkan Thiriyum. We know you are a very respectable man and I am offering my uh, namaskarams or salutations to you. So the headman was very thrilled that a person from the, I mean, the opposite side, the advocate of the opposite side is addressing him with so much of respect and uh, compassion than his own advocate. So what happens after that? The person, the witness starts giving answers in favor of the opposite side. That is cunning. That is the way in which you handle the witness. Every witness expects respect. You know, please don't, I mean, I'm saying that very, uh, after much, uh, I mean, uh, what I've been taught, you have to treat the witness with respect. Or you have to really, see, it depends on the witness, but a person, a senior citizen, who is occupying a high position, definitely expects the respect which he should be given. So if you start working on that and at the end, and, and uh, you will be surprised that the counsel on record was none other than the great Mr. K. Parasara, who had engaged my senior in this matter. So when, when I was talking to Mr. Parasara also, sir also, he told me that, see, Mr. Govind knew the psychology of the witness much, much better than his own advocate. And the other side advocate was none other than uh, I think it was uh, V.T. Ragasam Mayengar or uh, Mr. Vanama Malai's uh, senior. Vanama Malai, you all know that he's one of the greatest advocates uh, in the criminal side. So, when you know that a witness has to be handled in the manner which will give you the answers, I, then that is the most, uh, that's the, that is the thing commando. That's the style. You know, you have to attack him in the way in which he needs to be attacked. Then is brevity. Brevity is you no know, simple questions. Were you there at the time, sir? Sir, were you there at the time? Sir. So if you address the witness with that respect, I'm sure you will get the answers. So that is think command. And those should be your beacons when you are when you are uh, countering a witness. The second rule is when you have got what you want, stop. If on the or witness on the, suppose you want to get some answers from him, like sir, ringa on the on the Sunday, narakum bode, ninga ngirdingla. This is, a, this is a question. He will say either I was not there or I do not know or yes, I was there but I did not see I was there but I did not see the fight or I was prevented or there was some obstruction so I was not a direct witness to the fight or whatever it is. Now, what he would have said in his confession statement or what he would have said in the 161 statement would have been entirely different. So, if you want, that is, if you want an answer which he said in his 161 statement, that is in a criminal case or in the pleadings in a civil case or in any document attached to the plaint or the written statement in a civil case, you need not go any further. You just got to stop. And you should know when to stop. If you do not do that, you are diluting the case. You are damaging your wounds. So the second rule is when you got what you want, stop. And not a word beyond that. Secondly is, don't try to improve the answers. Don't try to ask questions which probably you may not be happy with those answers. I do agree. But if that is necessary for the case, don't ask or 
any questions which will try to improve his answers don't allow that because the witness will sense after answering the question he will sense that i have got the answers that is the advocate has got the answers and he will try to backtrack if you ask any further question he will try to backtrack on the earlier answers and then it will dilute the uh, dilute the very purpose of asking the question itself isn't it so don't ask any further questions because the witness will always sense that he has made a mistake and he will try to backtrack either now or in some other question which you are going to ask in future he will try to cover up this lacuna in those answers so you have to be very very careful while asking these questions the next thing is friends you will always have to have the final argument at the back of your mind when you are asking these questions in cross examination what is your going to be your framework or argument you will know that when you are reading the pleadings when you are reading the written statement when you are reading the documents which is presented before you or when you are filing the case you know your case definitely friends you will know your case definitely you will know but maybe some there are some gaps which you will try to cover up in your evidence and it may be documentary evidence or oral evidence now we are dealing with oral evidence so sometimes you may come across certain documents which may not be very clear to you while reading you will not know the intention behind which the witness wrote the document or the letter so you will be in a quandary or you will be having a little doubt as to why he wrote that letter so when you are asking a question about this letter though the contents are very clear you can raise an element of doubt whether this man wrote it intentionally or was there any coercion in writing this letter this is going to be your doubt which you are going to probably clarify with them. so you will have to ask certain questions which will say whether when you wrote the letter where were, were there anybody with you or you wrote it on your own or what was the i mean what was the necessity to write a letter so these are certain questions you may like to ask when you want to fill in certain gaps so but when you ask these questions you will have to weigh the answers and what sort of an answer you get may decide the fate of the case or preparing you for the final argument so this is the second rule so you have to be you have to weigh the answers you know you have to find out whether this is really necessary uh to uh, which may uh, go in your favor then the answers are really necessary to support your case now the third rule is the third rule i won't say third rule it's a corollary to this never ever say thank you to the witness some people say thank you it, it comes out of emotion you know when you when you do something good and somebody will automatically say thank you uh, you feel good but in evidence you you should avoid that because you may get an answer in your favor and if you say thank you the witness is def definitely the witness is sensing whether it is a proper thing to say or not and if you say thank you definitely you know it is the this is not the answer you should be giving and you will try to backtrack that in future in other questions or whatever you questions you ask you will try to clarify this so never ever say thank you <coughs> sorry <coughs> so these are some of the basics you have to understand when you are doing see the body language of the witness the body language of the one uh, the advocate is very important so don't you know you really get sometimes you know i i i i saw a few advocates getting really excited when they got some answers because the witness also senses your body language and he feels your body language when you are when you are answering or when you are asking certain questions so you have to be very clear or very careful that you don't expose your body language too much to the witness because the witness also is an equally a very shrewd person and he knows what you are thinking is and it's a fight between the battle between the uh the brains the, the battle of brains between you and him so 
don't expose yourself by saying thank you or you know nandri or uh, with or show your excitement on uh, getting these answers so this is what you should avoid while following the second rule now the third rule is never ever ask a question which you do not already know the answer it's very important because this is a question which <coughs> exposes you about your own lack of knowledge about the case every question which you ask you should know the answer it can be a yes it can be a no because put yourself in the witness's box you know you are standing as a witness and you you imagine the advocate asking you a question and what would you answer so you have to be very clear of the answers if you do not know the answer don't try to dig around it's very dangerous if you do not know the answer yourself don't ask that question because you will never ever get to the clear answer because the witness senses that you are trying to fish around you are trying to dig around for the answer so you have to be very clear about the question because sometimes you also will not you, because you have no idea what you will find because if you do not know the answer you you I mean you you maybe the witness knows the answer you do not know the answer so he will give you an answer which can really surprise you and which may have a big dent on your case and another thing important thing is don't ever gamble with your cases it's it's gambling cross examination is uh, can be precise if you are really good in that or you are going to gamble you're going to ask for answer really wild and those answers may have no bearing on the case at all so you have to have the brain of a mathematical weasel cunning calculative and always look out for the uh, odds which will be in your favor when i say mathematical weasel you will have to be extremely precise about the questions you are asking the questions make a lot of difference and don't ask questions which again i repeat you do not know the answer because whatever answers he is going to give may affect your final arguments which you are already prepared to argue then then the next question is the why do you ask that question now i am asking you i am mean, asking myself what is what then is the point of only asking questions to which the answer is known why do you ask questions only for those or why do you ask questions for only those where the answer is known the answer is you have to draw attention to your case you draw attention to your case only when you ask questions for which you know the answer so the most important thing is you have to draw attention to your case so that is why your the third rule is to draw attention to your case now let's go to the fourth rule the next thing is uh sorry before going to the fourth rule i got one more thing to add the judge you see when you are doing the examination the judge does normally is not uh seen the witness from your perspective the judge never sees the witness in, from your perspective you are trying to argue or trying to prove the witness is wrong or he is a, is a, is a false witness the judge will have to know that your case or your perspective of the witness is to prove him wrong or to prove him right if he is if you are appearing for the plaintiff you will have to say that the witness is supporting your case to prove your case is right or if you are appearing against the plaintiff you have to prove or the judge will have to understand your perspective about the witness so he will have to <coughs> you will have to draw attention 
to certain facts from the witness's demeanor or from the conduct of the witness when you are asking certain questions so your job is to draw i mean draw the facts together to present a fresh perspective to the judge so when a judge sees your perspective then he will understand that this is what your case is going to be and this is what then this is what and the facts which you present is what makes the judge understand the case from your perspective so <clears throat> your perspective would be suppose you say uh, let us say let us take an example of this your perspective is it was 3 am she was you are asking about a burglary case okay it was 3 am yes it was night time yes the burglar was in the garden yes you switched off the lights you switched on the lights yes he, then he took 10 minutes to reach the fence yes uh you turned on the light yes you looked out of the window yes you say he looked up at you yes and then he was off yes so this is the perspective you want to give to the judge by asking certain questions because i had made certain notes and uh, which my uh, uh, senior had in fact he had uh, done one of his earlier cases he was just how do you say the judge knows your what is your perspective is these are the questions which i asked which will draw attention to my case and make the judge understand my perspective to your uh, case so this is how we build a case so these are the small things which you have to understand in the nuances of cross examination next we go to the the other rule uh the not the other rule that the 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 other aspect of this particular rule is why do we ask these questions why does and the uh, uh, judge want to understand our perspective is suppose you sense that the judge is not in your favor or he feels the judge may have his own perception okay so you have your perception about your case the judge has perception about this case and the other side has got a perception about his case so why why do you do all these things the main answer would be you have to bend the perception you know you have to bend the perception of the judge to come to your point of view so that he understands the case from your perspective cross examination is all about bending the perception friends you can make it very very interesting in cross examination if you really feel that you should do that because it's all about bending the perception what you feel can be really changed to what i feel about this case so that's where the cross examination makes a very interesting subject and the next rule will be always ask leading questions so i i i in fact um <coughs> uh, uh read the evidence act and the evidence act is also very clear on this subject that section 1 uh 143 of the evidence act it very clearly says leading questions may be asked in cross examination so 143 supports you and 143 is one of the is the fourth rule which says always ask leading questions because the other side cannot object to unlike in a examination in chief or in re examination now but when you are asking a leading question never ask a open question never ask a open question the leading question will be <coughs> did you not write this letter or you are the author of this letter you are the author of this letter that's the leading question so when you are asking this question it can be only yes or no that's all and if you know he has not written that 
if you have not written that letter don't ask that question following rule number 2 never ask a question for which you do not know the answer three maybe yeah so these are the things which you should follow these are the rules the normal rules never ask a open question next will be if you are asking a uh, if you are asking a leading question why do you ask a leading question a leading question is asked to control the answer this is because a leading question gives the answer and the witness should say simply say yes this is the ideal answer to every question see the yes is the ideal answer to every question if you give the answer you control the answer this is why you ask leading questions see you should be able to control the answer so if you give the answer you control the answer controlling the answer means controlling the witness this is very important principles which you should know you should always be in control of the witness because if you are not in control of the witness then he becomes a deadly weapon you know he is going to give you a, a, a very tough case to handle <clears throat> now let us take a simple question like this you say the answer <clears throat> you were there in the wedding isn't it so you give a tag to the dancer the question is you were there in the wedding the tag is isn't it so and he knows it is the right answer because he was there the witnesses were there to show that he was present the photographs were been marked as uh, evidence and so he has to give the answer yes sometimes you don't even have to ask the tag see sometimes you can just say you were there in the wedding that's all isn't it they need not be in certain things you need not even ask because it is very evident that he was there <clears throat> now this is a leading question now if you are going to ask a open question let me give you an example you will say where where were you instead of asking you were at the wedding which is a leading question the open question will be where were you then what happens is the witness starts giving a very different answer because it's a open question so he can say wherever he was you need not say because he can say he was at at this place or at a some other place or some other which is uh, which is a open question so you don't if you ask that question you are asking for trouble so never ask the open question the next thing would be to follow will be the next thing which you should not be doing is the best way to lose control is to make the witness ask for explanation suppose he says i ask you i am asking him a question where were you he says he was there then you are asking him to give an explanation why he was there what was he doing all those questions are going to help you to lose the case friends you have to be really careful when asking these open questions because you are going to ask you are inviting disaster for your case <coughs> so the fourth rule is only leading questions and not open questions now let's go to the fifth rule the fifth rule is never ever this is a is a corollary to this earlier rule ne <coughs> sorry never ever ask the witness to explain i will give you a small example never ask the witness the question why the problem with an explanation from the witness is that it will destroy an ex an explanation will destroy your very purpose of asking that question the explanation will only be to the effect sorry i'm sorry the explanation will be only to undermine your case it will never determine your case it will undermine your case 
and the next thing is the explanation you will want to give in that closing speech or the argument which you call it the closing speech will the witness will always find explaining the reason for not doing anything or for doing something which you expect him not to do so when you are asking for an explanation then you are asking for trouble and the cleverest of the witnesses will easily find out why you are asking for this explanation and most of the witnesses namely the expert witnesses who are giving uh, <clears throat> uh, answers never ask open question i will give you a very interesting question which is called the counterfeit note case it was handled by my senior it is called krishnan counterfeit note case i'm sure you will all be aware of that it is reported in ar 1964 madras okay that was a case <clears throat> where mr krishnan who was a master in counterfeiting notes in fact he was his notes look more genuine than the reserve bank notes friends he had a machine which he imported from germany which was in the basement of his house which can probably print notes much in quality much better than the notes printed by the reserve bank in the nasik plant so that was the ingenuity of krishna <coughs> in that case friends it was before uh, I, i i don't i don't know whether it was this is rajaman nar or it was somebody else sitipur he was not the judge it was somebody it was somebody else and uh, the mint expert was asked to give evidence uh i think this is uh, i mean uh, 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 i think uh, mr vt rangaswamy engar was examining was one of the doyans of the criminal side and <clears throat> he was asking questions with the mint expert he was appearing for krishna who was the accused in the counterfeit note case and the mint expert was being asked questions on how and i mean how did he find that these notes are not the genuine notes or how did he find that these notes are the genuine notes and almost you know some of the questions he had covered 80% of the uh, uh, process of printing notes i mean the process of printing notes he was asking several questions at one point of time <coughs> sorry rangasamy engar gave a bunch of notes to the mint expert and in those notes there were genuine notes and counterfeit notes and he gave that bunch to the mint expert and asked him to find out which are the counterfeit notes so the mint expert uh, you know just uh, you know took this uh, bundle and just did this about four notes came out from that bundle so he said these are the counterfeit notes <coughs> the next question was which you should which he should not have asked which he asked how did you find it out or give me an answer how did you know that these these are counterfeit notes so the expert never gave an answer he just kept quiet and uh, the 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 uh, rangsam engar was a little perturbed and the and the and the witness was laughing and uh, he didn't know what was the joke you know why it is a serious matter it is a serious question and why does the mint expert laugh so the judge asked the mint expert what is the necessity for you to laugh so the mint expert asked the judge to give a piece of paper and i uh, the, the bench officer gave a piece of paper and on which he wrote some answers and gave it to the judge so the judge read those answers and started laughing himself so rangsa mengar was very much uh, rajagopal Raj, Raj, i mean i think it's rajagopal he was very much uh, upset about the way in which the judge and the witness were laughing or he was they thought he was making fun of him 
so he was very serious he asked the judge you know why are you laughing i am asking a question but how did he know that it is all counterfeit notes <coughs> so the judge said mr counsel if he is going to give you the answer to that question he says that you will start printing notes better than krishna so this was the answer given by the judge and this was the answer given by the mint expert so you cannot ask any question for which you do not know the answer the rule number 2 and never ask a witness to explain or why if you are going to ask those questions these are going to damage your own case so the next the fifth rule is never ever ask the witness to explain and never ever ask the question for which you do not know the answer so this is one of the uh, uh, notes which my uh, senior had prepared on this particular rule and this particular case i think everybody will know about counterfeit uh, the christians counterfeit note case which was uh, as popular as the lakshmi kantan murder case in which you had <coughs> sorry several celebrities like jagraja bhagavadar ns krishnan then uh, uh, pakshiraj studios uh, sri ramulu naidu these were some of the celebrities who were in the lakshmi kantan murder case which also was a sensational case similarly the counterfeit gopalan's case was also very sensational case and gopalan was from a very affluent family and i didn't i don't know why he had to do this because he was a very very rich man himself and he is from coimbatore who was a, a very fertile place and uh, this is one of the sensational cases handled by my senior and uh, of course he was sentenced and he had to undergo imprisonment so this is how a question can turn answers against you <clears throat> and secondly friends you also got to understand that whatever you see in the films or whatever you see on paper does not give you the correct picture about the answers given by the witness or the truth about the case because a lot of cases are being done by media and a lot of exaggerations are there even though there may be only 60% truth in all these cases it looks as though uh, the media is condemning the man for a crime probably which he really was not directly involved or even remotely involved so trial by media is now i mean it's it's, it's causing a lot of concern because in those days you never had the uh, such wide media publicity and it was only in the papers now we have tv you have got the various uh, social medias to project or give reactions to certain cases for which i think it's only the court to decide and not the media and um, uh, christian's case was also very uh, very was uh, was reported in the papers but however you know the, the the court never took cognizance of those and they sentenced him even though there were uh, views uh, explaining the conduct of krishnan and he could have been released on a benefit of doubt but however the court found that there had damning evidence against krishnan and he was sentenced <coughs> because the other thing which you have to understand is that the very purpose of cross examination is to persuade the judge when you are doing the arguments to see your perspective it's it's a question of persuasion the art of persuasion comes or the persuasion of your case even though you may have a weak case will come only when you are absolutely sure about the answers which you need to get from the witness having got a, a wrong answer i mean having got a adverse answer from the witness don't ever think you can persuade unless you have got a written document which is contrary to the evidence given by the witness which is section 91 of the evidence act see documents for which you have authentic proof need not be put in cross examination because if you are asked, having a document where there is an admission of the document by the witness or by the your opposite party there is no necessity for you to cross examine him on the document unless you find certain lacuna in the document 
or maybe you see that the handwriting is different if you are defending the witness you can say the handwriting is not fine or you can go for a, a expert uh, witness to prove your handwriting it's a different matter <clears throat> but when there is an admission about the document don't cross examine him on that and come back to persuade the judge to accept the answers as wrong you know you, you, i mean is you don't have to really put yourself give you i mean put yourself in the trouble of uh, back tracking and then trying to persuade the judge to understand or make him understand that this is why you asked this question and this is why you got the answer and now i am trying to say that this is not right and that is wrong so these troubles can be avoided uh the sixth rule is always understand that you need not ask everything to the witness reserve your comments for the judge never ever ever for the witness you have to reserve your comments only for the judge and not the witness this is known as <clears throat> don't ask conclusionary questions when i say don't ask conclusionary questions it means it questions which demand a conclusion from the witness that is only for the judge you reserve it for the judge don't reserve it for the witness for example you are going to counter a witness with a certain fact the question is <clears throat> whether that fact or asking the witness the fact is correct or not that is not for the witness to put that question to the witness because he is never going to say it is correct or he is never going to say it is wrong if he is if he is on the opposite side so the conclusions <clears throat> which you have in mind which you have got the answers for from the witness you never ask the conclusionary questions if you are going to ask those conclusionary questions again you are going to dilute the answers and it is also going to affect your case in the long run in at the end of the so i let me ask you uh, let me put across a question which will probably really affect your case in the long run let me ask a question like this which probably is a stupid question to ask in all these uh, when i am asking a question to a person a burglar or seen a burglar uh, i mean a burglary and an identification is being carried out you are asking a question to the person a witness in all these who is who is who is going to probably be a hostile witness because of this uh, maybe because of this particular question so in all these circumstances i have asked you about you did not see him long enough to clearly make an identification about which you can be sure of can you this is a stupid question to ask a witness when the witness has very clearly said in his 161 statements that this is what i have seen and i know him and by asking this question you are diluting that answer and what is the reply you we expect from that question <coughs> it's going to be an answer which probably goes against his own statement or is probably going to help the accused in these things so that is why you say never ask why never ask an explanation and you reserve your comments only for the jury <coughs> so friends this is some of the rules which you are have to follow and this is some of the rules which you need to keep at the back of your mind and never ever break those rules until you are very very sure that you can uh, probably play around with because you have a mastery over that subject the seventh rule is never ask the witness for help a witness under cross examination will kick you in the head because he is going to be very very 
anti you he is not going to give you whatever you ask for he is not going to help you to uh, build your own case so never ever ask a witness for help and that will be breaking the third rule about always asking questions for which you know the answer don't ask a question because you are asking this is related to rule number 3 where you say never ask a question for which you do not know the answer so by asking this question by 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 doing this you are asking for help from the witness and asking for explanation is asking for help and the witness will definitely know that you have no clue about this case please understand friends witnesses are much sharper than what we think they are they know what to answer they have been tutored also well by their own counsels and if a counsel other side counsel is a well uh, <clears throat> is an expert in cross examination or is an expert in trial work definitely he will tell his witness that these are the questions you are going to be asked and this is how you have to be answered so never ever ask the witness for it. and by doing that you are drowning your arguments before the jury so always remember this is a very important rule which has its roots in rule number 3 and if you are going to ask that question or by mistake you ask such a question you will have to cover up that so you may have to do i mean i'll be explaining to you probably in the next session about ring fencing how do you cover the lacuna in your question suppose you have made some mistakes in your questions and you have to backtrack on certain things in order to ensure that those do not affect your case i will be probably covering that in my next lecture called ring fencing how do you cover up those lacuna because that itself is a another subject by itself so i will explain these rules to you the 10 rules and probably i will be continuing in my next session called ring fencing now the seventh the, no no having asked this question or having asked the witness for help and you know you know probably in the spur of the moment you have asked him for help and you realize that you should not have asked that question <clears throat> you have to seek for a life belt you know you have to save yourself I mean, you, how do you save yourself? Uh, you have asked him a question about how sure are you about the identification, which probably creates a doubt in the minds of the judge when you are asking, arguing the case. Now you have to backtrack that. You may have to reopen the. You have to file a petition to recall the witness to ask certain questions. Or if you have realized it soon enough, you may have to ask this question. uh you can say in a with a smiling face you can say ask him surely you cannot be certain of the identification i mean it really was dark that's fair isn't it so you may have to backtrack that because you have asked him about a question regarding the identification you will have to now backtrack and say i'm sure you are not sure about the identification or since it was very dark you are not very sure about that man whom you say was the burglar so these are some of the questions uh, which you please you will have to ask in the spur of the moment because there are you can't be following a, a definite pattern of questions because sometimes you have to ask in the spur of the moment certain questions uh, <clears throat> so you may have to do certain things but i will advise you strongly never ever go for the life belt because you are asking for trouble you are definitely asking for trouble if you are going for the life belt and that should be used only in the uh, very sparingly or probably in the rarest cases where you are not sure about <coughs> your uh, questions so the next way of asking a question is you have to use certain jargons when you are when you are asking uh, you will say Uh, you may have to start say you may have to say i dare say, or o oh, i see or whatever is it ensure that these questions are not asked in a regular pattern because these are some of the questions which may have to be fillers but never ever ask these questions in your routine way of cross examination but the ultimate rule is 
don't ever seek for help from the witness because when you asking for some help as i explained to you in the mint case you are asking for help from the mint expert how do you find these notes are counterfeit notes that means you are asking for help and that is the thing one we should always avoid i would definitely say we should always avoid now coming to the eighth rule you should be very clear you ask only one thing one question at a time some people ask very lengthy questions you know uh, how do you do I mean if you, because normally in a cross examination you will have to stick to leading questions because that is where you are going to pin the witness to a particular fact or to a particular point now if you are going to ask too many uh, i mean very lengthy question uh, the framing of the questions if it is very lengthy then you are not going to get an, a, a very pinpointed answer or an exact answer which you would like to have so try to break down the questions into short questions because that will have more impact on the witness than you will ever think it is the in the or at this junction i would like to highlight one view one point which will probably relate to this uh, eighth rule i am making it a little interesting because i don't want you to get a little bored about these things because it's more uh, theoretical i'm going to relate this to another field uh, music see all of you would have heard of kannadasan all of you would have heard of ms vishwanathan ninga ellarume you would have watched several movies of shivaji ganeshan and uh, i'm sure all of you are aware of that and you all know about that in one particular uh, uh, situation kannadasan wrote a song which was which had three sentences in one paragraph three sentences continuous it's a song and it's a it's a lengthy sentence it's a very lengthy sentence so when pachai uh, vilakku nenikiren this is a shivaji ganeshan's movie produced by avm chetiya and when he heard that the song was recorded of course it never featured in that film avm chetiya said see they are come from the same village karaikudi so he he told the kannadasan uh, uh, kannadasan see when you write songs it should be very short sentences if you are going to write lengthy sentences the people will not remember that song because it's very difficult to memorize those songs but if you do it in short sentences people it will be very catchy and it will the people will remember that song for a long time and that was one rule which kannadasan followed even I mean, be implicitly throughout his career because all his songs i'm sure you will never ever forget all his songs because it is very catchy very simple brevity simple catchy short so these are the principles which you have to follow in cross examination also because you can't be asking lengthy sentences because the witness will not understand what you are asking first and secondly he will try to give an answer which has got no relation to your questions so these are the things which i would like you to understand before entering into the nuances of cross examination